Thanks so much for joining us. I'm going to be talking a little bit about some um, early literacy stuff. And um, oh, I forgot. When I'm on this, it takes forever for my computer to respond. All right. Um, OK, so I am um, a former children's librarian. And uh, I left work to stay home with my kids. and. Most of you have heard the story before, but I actually joined Usborne when my second was five months old because I was going kind of stir crazy as a stay at home mom. And Usborne has always been my favorite publishing company. Um, and so it seemed like a really great thing for me to be able to work from home. But as a children's librarian, I had a focus on early literacy. And uh, technically, early literacy goes up to um, age eight, is like what's generally considered the cutoff for early literacy. But in my case, I focused on birth through entering kindergarten, so birth through about five or six. And um, as uh, the way that I started doing that is that um, back in, I'm not really sure when, probably like 2007 or 2008, there's, there's this really big organization called ALA, the American Library Association, that has all of these smaller little subsets of it called like PLA, the Public Library Association, and um, uh, I can't remember what the children's one is right now because uh, I'm tired. Anyway, so there's a, there's a children's. Um, a children's focused one and a public library association focused one. And those two got together and um, put together these two programs called Every Child Ready to Read, which were geared toward, towards um, encouraging public librarians to um, get trained in early literacy and um, start educating caregivers and parents in early literacy because public librarians often see children before they go into kindergarten and there's this like magic window of time when kids are really young where we can reach out reach out to them and make a whole lot of impact in their development and public librarians had this unique ability to reach out to them at this time because kids were going into story times and they weren't in school yet some of them might have gone to preschool but you know in this country we don't have standardized national preschool and so um, so public librarians were seen as this way to reach kids that might not otherwise be reached. And so I got involved, I got trained through this program called Every Child Ready to Read. And then um, I became involved in this statewide organization called the Ohio Ready to Read Task Force um, that we sort of um, had this grassroots mission to reach out to librarians in the state and train them on this program and um, encourage them to take part, like, participate in these programs and train um, parents and caregivers and um, early childhood development people and things like that, or early childhood care providers and things like that, and um, provide resources for them so that they could replicate these training programs and things like that. And I was also a regional trainer for them. So I would go around and um, I had a six day or six hour long training that I did, like an all day long training that I did for librarians. And then I used to do like a um, two hour workshop that was geared towards parents. And these slides that I'm going to show you tonight are actually taken straight from those workshops that I used to do with librarians. And they're, you know, you're, you're not obviously getting six hours. You're getting a really condensed version. You're actually getting like half of what I used to do. You're getting like a third of what I used to do in my two hour long parent workshop. All right, so how many times have you heard someone say, oh, I don't read to my baby. They're not, <laughs> they, don't, they don't need, why would you read to a baby? They just eat the books, you know, whatever. Well, this is why you want to read to a baby. Uh, we have this magic window from birth to age three where the brain has this amazing growth, amazing growth. So this is um, a diagram of synaptic density. And what synaptic density is, is um, so we're, burn, well, we're born with billions of brain cells, billions of neurons in our brains. We have more 
neurons in our brains than there are stars in the universe. But at birth, they're not connected. They don't, have, they don't talk to each other. And the way that we learn things and the way that we are able to replicate that, those learning experiences in the future is by um, those neurons talking to each other, sending out a little electrical impulse, and sort of creating a bridge to another neuron. And that's called a synapse, OK? So at birth, those, those little lines there on the left-hand side, that's the synaptic density of a child's brain at birth. There's not a whole lot going on there because they haven't had a whole lot of experiences that would cause one of those neurons. I'm getting some, I don't know if that's me. I don't think it's me, though. All right. It sounds like someone might be driving. If you're listening and driving at the same time, can you mute your phone, please? Um, so at birth, the way that those neurons send out that electrical impulse is they experience something new. And the brain goes, whoa, that's new. I need to respond to that. And so that neuron sends out an electrical impulse. And it connects to another neuron, and it makes a synapse. OK, so at birth, there hasn't been a whole lot of experience. And so there's not a whole lot of synaptic density. And then at six years old, you can see how incredibly dense um, the, the synaptic density is, how much, how much connection there is. And that's because there's a whole lot of learning. OK. OK, we're getting a lot of feedback from somebody that has their speakers on and their mic on at the same time. And it's not me this time. <laughs> All right, so um, as you can see, there's a whole lot of synaptic growth that happens between birth and six years old. And then what happens is right around like nine years old, right when the hormones start to kick in, those synapses start to be pruned away. This is really distracting because I'm hearing myself in echo. So, Okay, whoever doesn't have their, their microphone muted, can you please mute your microphone? Okay. All right. Um, so then right around like 9 to 10 years old, right when the hormones start to kick in, those synapses start to be pruned away. And that's actually a good thing because it helps us specialize. It help us, helps us focus in on what's the important information and what's what we need to keep. Otherwise, there would be so much noise going on in our head that we wouldn't we wouldn't really be able to um, we wouldn't really be able to memorize things. We wouldn't really be able to focus on anything important because um, there'd be so much going on. And it's sort of like what we need to keep in mind here is that you need to use it or you lose it. So we need to make sure, and, and we need to make sure that we're telling parents that the, um, we need to make sure that we are making sure that the synapses that we want to keep are the ones that are firing over and over and over. So um, it's sort of like when you're making a path through the woods. If you walk that path over and over and over again, the path stays nice and clear and you can walk it and you know it doesn't get overgrown. But if you stop using it, it starts to get overgrown and eventually the path will disappear completely. It's the same way with synaptic with the, with synapses. Um, so um, as I was saying, uh, from birth to age three, there's like this magic window where the brain is just completely alive. It has more synaptic density than at any other time during the year. And that's why this is like the magic window for language development and um, everything like that. Um, 
and I had something else that I was going to say, and I forgot what it was. But so this is another illustration of um, why reading early is still really important, but also why it's not too late. If you didn't read to your baby, it's not too late to read to your toddler or to your preschooler or even to your elementary age kid because our brains have this amazing plasticity. And what that means is that if the brain is damaged, or if you have an area of the brain that's been sort of suffocated because it's been malnourished, uh, it's, our brains have this amazing ability to regenerate themselves and to heal themselves. And this is true in adults, but it's even more true in kids. So what we have here on the left-hand side is um, a PET scan of a healthy child's brain. And you can see that on the temporal lobes, these are the lobes that have to do with um, reasoning, like cognitive development. Um, uh, sorry, executive decision making and that sort of things. These temporal lobes are um, very active in a, in a healthy brain scan. But on the left hand side, with a neglected child, they're, they're absent. And why that is, is because um, we have two um, chemicals in the brain. So one of them is called cortisol. And cortisol is released in stressful situations. Okay, so um, when we were running on a savanna from a lion back, you know, when we used to live in the, in the grassy plains or whatever, and we were running from a lion on a savanna, our, our body would basically shut down because that's what cortisol does. Your brain, your, your brain goes, oh my gosh, we're being chased by a lion. We have to escape. It sends out a rush of adrenaline, but it also sends out cortisol. And that causes everything else in the body to stop. You, you stop digestion, you stop growth, your hair stops growing, like everything else stops that's not essential to you getting away from that lion, okay? Well, when we experience stress nowadays, we're not being chased by a lion. It's not usually a, like a survival situation. It's more like somebody cut us off in traffic or we're really ticked off because we want to get home and we're in line at the grocery store and our kids are having a meltdown. But our brains don't recognize the difference between that and being chased by a lion. So they, are, they respond in the same way, okay? So with a kid being in a stressful situation, it's more like... Um, you know, maybe they don't have a stable home environment. Maybe they don't have enough to eat. Maybe their parents are fighting all the time. Maybe they just don't get the love that they want. So their brain, when they're constantly in a stressful situation, is constantly sending out cortisol. And so it's, it's causing them to not develop in the way that a typical healthy child would develop. On the other hand, when a child feels good and they're loved for and they're happy, for example, when a parent is holding them on their lap, lap and snuggling them and reading them a book and giving them lots of kisses, um, their brain produces serotonin, which increases the, the brain's ability to create synapses and to build those connections, okay? So um, serotonin is the happy hormone and it helps kids build connections. Cortisol is the stress uh, hormone and not only does it stop body development but it actually stops brain development and it will inhibit those um, synaptic, that synaptic development. These two scans, this left one is just a healthy child but the one on the right that's the neglected child, this is actually a scan of um, a neglected Romanian orphan who was, um, was uh, like adopted from the country and brought to the U.S. and was adopted out to an Ameri you know, American family. And this was their scan when they were first adopted. And um, they were taken into a loving home and they were treated, you know, just like any other healthy American child. They were bred to and made sure that they had enough food to eat and they didn't have any of the stresses that they had before. They brought them back two years later. They were two at the time that the scan was taken. They brought them back two years later, and their brains had almost entirely recovered. Their scans were almost exactly identical to a scan of a healthy child. That is the amazing plasticity of a child's brain. Um, and so that's another reason to tell people 
like, yeah, maybe you didn't read to your six month old and it might be sort of hard to get your 12 or 18 month old to sit down for a book now, but no, it really is worth the effort and it is definitely not too late. Okay, so um, early literacy for our purposes, what we're gonna be talking about tonight is not teaching a child how to read. And in fact, we all come from different backgrounds, okay? So unless you are a reading specialist or a reading teacher, I would encourage you not to offer reading advice because um, the worst thing that we can do for a child is create a negative association with learning how to read at the very beginning of when they're starting to learn how to read. And so I don't want to teach, I don't want to try to teach my four-year-old how to read when I'm not a reading specialist and I don't know what I'm doing and have them fail and go into kindergarten thinking that they don't know how to read and they're dumb and they're never going to learn how to read. That's the last thing I want to do, right? Um, so for, for our purposes, what we're going to be talking about tonight, early literacy is what a child knows about reading and writing before they can actually read or write. So we're going to be focusing primarily on the pre, like the birth to five or six age kid. Okay. Um, so it's building a nice strong foundation so that they're ready to learn to read when they go into kindergarten. And uh, kids are, are building skills to prepare them to learn how to read starting like right from the moment that they're born by things like nursery rhymes um, are helping to build phonological awareness, which we'll talk about later. They're learning vocabulary. They're learning storytelling. They're building skills that will increase their, their reading comprehension. All of these things start literally from birth. And one of the core components of ECRR was um, sort of encouraging parents to understand that they are their child's first and most influential teacher. And I think this is something really valuable that we can give to parents too, because we are in this really unique situation where we're talking directly to the parents and they're, they look up to us because we're the book people, you know, like they, we know what we're talking about, we're the book people. So I think it's really important for us to encourage them to realize that they, they they are empowered to teach their children. They are their children's first teacher. They know their child best. They know their child better than anyone else. They know their learning style. And they need to understand that children learn best by doing. And there's literally no one else in the entire world that they would rather do things with than their mom or their dad. Um, and also, ECR was was dedicated not only to empowering them to do this, but to help help them understand how the normal things that you do with parenting, the playing and the singing and the talking and the pretending and all those things, how if you do them in an intentional manner, they can be really influential in, in building a child's early literacy. Okay, so there are actually two iterations of ECRR. The first one that came out was based on the six early literacy skills that we're going to talk about tonight. And the second one um, of Every Child Ready to Read 2 took those six early literacy skills and tried to make it more approachable and put them into five practices that parents do every day with their kids anyway, talking, singing, reading, writing, and playing. It, and it basically, it took out it didn't really take it out, but it refocused the science that was involved in the six early literacy skills, and it took out anything that could be construed as jargon or intimidating, and it put the six skills in the context of these five simple practices. Um, and the goal was just to, I don't know, to give, to have parents participate in these activities with intent as well as enthusiasm, and. Um, it didn't use any of the words, so it was it was basically teaching them how to incorporate things like narrative skills into pretend play, but they didn't use those words. And so the I just wanted to give you guys an overview of this in case you go to your public libraries and they use Every Child Ready to Read and they're using different vocabulary than what I'm using here. I'm going to be focusing on Every Child Ready to Read tonight because I think it's more impressive and um, I think it, it sounds better when you're trying to talk to parents. It sounds more like you know what you're talking about than if you say, oh, well, if you talk to your child, you'll really help them build the, their vocabulary. Yes, of course you will. <laughs> we all know that. If we use the impressive vocabulary, we'll sound a lot smarter. 
Uh, and we are still getting some feedback from someone that has their microphone on, too. All right. So the first um, early literacy skill that I want to talk about is print motivation. And uh, the easier way to remember print motivation is just loving books. It's a child's interest in and enjoyment in books and reading. Uh, and this is important because children who have a strong desire to read will have more success learning to read because they want to do it. And so they'll be more um, interested in learning how to read. They'll be more focused in their intent to learning how to read. Um, Okay, whoever does not have their their microphone muted, please mute your microphone because we're getting a lot of feedback. And we are recording. Okay. Um, so working on, uh, okay, I, I really dislike hearing myself in echo. So print motivation is the easiest. So like what I'm going to do when I talk about these skills is that I'm going to give you an overview of what the skill is. And then I'm going to give you some words that you can say to parents. And I'm basically taking those straight out of the um, program that I used to give to parents, my little two-hour workshops for parents. And then I'm going to talk about some characteristics for books that are good for building those skills. And some of them I will mention specific Osborne books, and some of them I'll just mention characteristics because we all have our favorite books. And you can use any book to support any skill. So you could look at your favorite picture book and figure out a way to make that support any skill that you want. So for me to make a list of any of like all these books that I use for whatever skill would almost be a waste of time because it might not work for you. So what I did was anything that came to, came to mind just as I was writing up the notes, I put it on the list. And other than that, I trust that you know the, the um, products well enough that you'll be able to pick out your own favorites. Okay. So, um, so what you say to, to parents is that this is the easiest of the early literacy skills to work on because all you have to do is make reading fun. And that means that you, you never make reading a chore. You never say, why can't you sit down and listen to this book? You never force a child to finish a book. If they don't want to finish a book, you say, okay, I can, see, I can see that you're not really interested in this right now. We'll finish this later. That's okay. Um, a lot of times, kids, uh, parents of like 18-month-old boys, this is like the typical mom of an 18-month-old boy statement, they'll say, he just will not sit still for a book. And you know what? That's okay. He can be playing with blocks or playing with his trains next to you, and you can be reading a book, and he is still getting that language enrichment and that language development, even though he's not sitting right next to you. And I guarantee that if you do that regularly, if you stop a book in the middle of the book, he will turn to you and he will say, Mommy, please finish the book, because he is listening and he is taking in that language, even if you don't think that he is. Um, and also, a really important thing to point out for this is that um, parents don't need to, um, like, when a, when a baby starts to mouth a book, I'm not saying if it's one of your booth books when it's, that it's on display, <laughs> but when they're at home and a baby starts to mouth a book, never say, no, 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 and grab the book from the baby because that is automatically a negative association for that baby with that book. If they are really worried about protecting that book, they just say, oh, here's, here's a toy. This is for chewing on. Books are for reading. But they, they don't have that gut reaction. Oh, no, 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 no. All right? Okay, so good books for print motivation are any books that you enjoy reading and that your child enjoys reading. But also, we have so many good books for print motivation, you guys. Like anything that's a manipulative, like Mouse About the House, our flat books, our interactive books, um, our wind-ups and pullbacks. And this video is um, a video that Joy Jewell pointed out to me yesterday. 
that is not, uh, it's, it's a video. Okay, we're getting a lot of feedback. It sounds like wind or garbage disposal or something. If you could mute. If you could mute your microphone, I would really appreciate it. Okay, so um, this video is from a therapist who uses our pullbacks for toy therapy. And it's a really fascinating video. Um, And I will post the link to this in Literacy League when we get done with this training. Um, also, people tend to discredit nonfiction as a print motivation tool, but for um, a lot of a lot of kids are not actually interested in reading storybooks. They want to read books that are about true things that they're interested in. So, uh, and this is a common thing too with older boys. I have a lot of. Okay, if everybody could mute their microphones, I would really appreciate it because we're recording this call. Just really would like everybody to mute. Okay. Um, I get this a lot from parents of older, like independent reading boys, they complain that they don't like to read when really it's that they don't like to read chapter books. They don't like to read fiction. They want to read nonfiction. And their mom doesn't think that that's real reading. That is just as real reading as reading chapter books. OK. I would really appreciate it if you would mute your microphone so that I'm not hearing myself in echo. It's very distracting. Okay, so we're also going to talk about vocabulary, also known as words. And this is just very simply how many words, oh my goodness, how many words your child knows. And this is really important because um, the more words, the more words your child knows, the easier it's going to be for them to uh, sound out words when they start reading. So your child's brain is like a database, okay? And the more words they have in their database, the better. Because, um, so let's say that you um, have never read heard the word carrot. You don't know what a carrot is. You've never eaten a carrot. You have no idea what it is. And you are reading a book and you come across the word carrot and you try to sound it out. If you have never seen a carrot, you don't know what a carrot is, you're going to go carrot. Carrot. And you're not going to have any idea what that is. However, if you know what a carrot is, most of the time when you're still in that decoding phase of reading, your books are going to have a little picture that goes with almost every sentence, right? So you're going to be reading the word carrot, and then you're going to go, I wonder if I can look at the picture and figure out what that, what that word is. And you're going to see a little bunny eating a carrot. And you're going to go, oh, that must be carrot, because you have that word in your database. So the more words that you can get in your child's database, the better. Uh, it'll increase their reading comprehension as they get older because they won't have to try to figure out what as many words mean in a sentence. If you know, you can use contextual clues, especially when you get older and you don't have pictures to work on when you're, you know, when you're when you're past the learning to read phase and you're in the reading to learn phase. You're not going to have pictures to help you figure out what those words are. So if you have several words in a sentence that you don't know what they mean, you can sound them out, but you don't know what they mean, it's really hard for you to use contextual clues to figure out what all those words mean. If there's just one word in a sentence or one word in a paragraph that you don't understand, it's much easier to figure out what it means based on context. Um, so what you say to parents is, 
talk to your child. Vocabulary development is clearly linked to the amount of talking that a parent does with their child. The more parents that um, talk with their babies, the larger the child's vocabulary is. By the time a child is two years old, those who have a high level of speech with their parents have a vocabulary five times as high as those who have experienced a low level of parental speech. Five times at two years old. And as they get older, that gap just gets bigger and bigger and bigger if they're not talking to their parents. Um, reading is like one of the best things that you can do to increase a child's vocabulary because books have more rare words than typical conversation, even just picture books. We just recently had um, an article shared in Literacy League about that. Um, and if you are familiar with the Read Aloud Handbook by Jim Trulis, there's a section where he talks about common words and rare words in the lexicon and how how having a higher number of rare words in a child's vocabulary increases their reading comprehension. Um, and then the other thing that's really great to talk to um, for with to parents about um, with vocabulary is labeling feelings as well as objects, um, and to go beyond basic feelings. Don't just talk about happy and sad, but with your toddler especially, talk about feelings like shy and embarrassed and frightened and nervous and those sorts of things because they'll help the child communicate more more effectively, and they'll help uh, help negate quite a few meltdowns because the child will be able to explain how they're feeling. So um, good books for building vocabulary. Our beginner series is fantastic. Nonfiction books are amazing for building vocabulary because they have more rare words per page than any other type of book. Picture books statistically have more rare words than typical conversation. Our see inside, look inside, and peek inside books those are nonfiction powerhouses in disguised as interactive fun books. Like those books are amazing. Our busy books are really great for um, younger kids. They are they have whole bunches of positional words on top of, besides, next to, below, and they're um, designed for toddlers um, and you know young preschoolers. And they also have those. Um, seek and finds on every page that are great for letter knowledge, which we'll talk about in a little bit. And then um, once they get a little bit older, um, they can start working on really short chapter books, books like Billy Bee and Hey Jack. Those chapter books can be read in one sitting. Those and like things like um, Snake and Lizard or Lizard and Snake or whatever they're called, whatever that book is called, things like that are great for kids that are transitioning, you're transitioning into reading aloud chapter books with them because you can read them all in one sitting if you want. Um, but you can also break them up. So like uh, you can start with a Hey Jack and read the whole thing in one sitting and it'll be um, sort of, it'll be like two long picture books, right? Um, and then you can transition to breaking it up into two chunks. And that coming back to the same story and help having them recall what you were talking about before is really great for reading comprehension. And um, I really like Snake and Lizard because those individual stories are about the length of a picture book, but they don't look like a picture book, they look like a chapter book. And so they're a really great transition in a chapter book. And seriously, just all of our books, our books are, you guys, if you are not familiar with the like variety available in children's literature, you just have no idea how amazing Usborne books are. Our books are so uniformly fantastic. You cannot go wrong with them. It, when I was working the reference desk, if someone would come up to me and say, I need a book about frogs for my six-year-old, I would just go to the 596 point whatevers where the frog books are, and I would scan for the hot air balloon. That's on the side of all Usborne books, because I knew that if I gave them an Usborne book, it would be an amazing book. That was like, that was years before I joined Usborne. That's how amazing Usborne books are. All right. Okay, so uh, the next skill is print awareness, also known as just using books. That's just understanding how a book works, how to handle a book, understanding that we read from left to right and top to bottom in English, noticing print everywhere, understanding that we read words not just in a book but in road signs and street signs and um, you know the grocery store. Like we need 
to know how to read and we need print to interact on a daily basis, okay? So um, what to say to parents um, is you can tell them that they can point to signs and other words around as they drive, shop, take walks, etc. Tell their child what they say and explain how words in print help us on a daily basis. Um, allow, their, allow their child to handle books from the very beginning. This is so important. Get board books if their child is very young and understand that accidents happen. They don't have to be concerned about protecting the book. And our 50% replacement guarantee is really great for that. Um, they can ac occasionally use their finger to track the words as they read. Do not, please, do not tell them to do that all the time because if they're tracking words on a picture book, they're going to be covering up the picture and that's going to really tick the kid off because kids read pictures at the beginning, right? So they want to be able to see that picture. They don't want our hand to be over it. Over it. Um, pick books with repeating words or phrases and teach the child the phrase and then point to it and have the kid say it when, when the time comes. So books that are really great for developing print awareness are um, books with signs and words as part of the illustrations. Um, all, of, all the baby books because babies need to be able to explore and mouth books because this is how they learn to love them. Um, like I said, books with repeated words or phrases. Books with simple text like that's not, that's not my series. These books can really grow with the kid because um, they're so repetitive that all they really have to do is figure out what one word on that page is. And they can usually figure it out by knowing what sounds some of the letters make and using the picture clues. So they can, they can quote unquote read those books at like three or four, right? Um, so these are, those are really great for print awareness because kids can read them before they can even read. Um, and then books with reading or writing as part of the story. Any book where a kid writes a letter as part of the story is great for Prince Awareness. Okay, my computer has decided not to. There we go. All right. Um, so letter knowledge is just knowing the alphabet, and this is obviously important because kids need to know their letters and their properties before they can learn how to read. Um, so the interesting point about this is that the first step to letter knowledge is actually shape recognition because if you think about it, the only difference, for example, between a lowercase h and a lowercase n is the height of that stem, right? So a child needs to be clued in to to picking out the differences in shapes, to shape differentiation, before they can even start picking out the differences in letters because they're just different shapes, right? Um, so um, we'll talk about this on the next slide, but so shape books are actually really great for that. So um, what you can, oh, and kids learn about letters in stages, typically. This is the typical development of learning letters, is that they learn the letter names first, because we sing the alphabet song with them. And then they learn um, the letter shapes. They learn how to pick out letters. They learn the letter shapes. And then um, they figure out how to match the letter names with the letter sounds. So after they've learned the letter names and then they can point to a letter C, then they can say C says k k k. Um, so what you can say to parents is uh, you can talk about shape recognition being the first step to letter recognition. I talk about that with the That's Not My series all the time because seek and finds are really great for developing um, like an awareness of shape recognition because that mouse is oriented at different plate, um, in different ways on different pages. Sometimes he's facing the front, sometimes he's facing the sides, whatever. And uh, so you have to understand what a mouse looks like in order to be able to find him. And that's the, that's the perfect very first seek and find. Right around like 12 to 14 months is when kids can usually start pointing out the mouse on every page. So I always talk about that's not my and how that's a really great series for building letter knowledge because of the shape identification properties. Um, they can also use toys to help with um, shape identification. 
you know, with a very young child, they can be like, oh, this block has corners. Do you feel the sharp corners? This ball is round and smooth. Feel how smooth this ball is. Um, when they talk about letters, it usually helps to talk about the letters that are of the most interest to your child first. So that's usually the first letter of their name first. So like Harper learned H first. Will knows W. I actually haven't even tried to teach Will any letters yet, and yet he can pick out W. Um, and then they can, once they know that one letter, they can help them find them everywhere, find them on signs, find them on grocery lists, whatever. Um, reading alphabet books is obviously a great thing to do and singing the alphabet song and then getting things like letter magnets and big foam letters, making letters out of clay or Play-Doh or things like that. And our wipe clean books are great for letter knowledge and, and, um, and all, also obviously print awareness as well um, since writing is part of print awareness and all of our shape books. And by the way, if you guys don't know O oh Baby, you should get O oh Baby. It's, it's an alphabet picture book, but it's got all these baby animals in it and um, it's adorable. And I, that's one of the books that I didn't realize was one of our books until I had joined Osborne. All right. Um, so phonological awareness is um, playing with sounds. It's the ability to play with the smaller sounds and words. And this is a necessary skill for kids to be able to break the code between the written letters, the written language, and the spoken language, the sounds that those letters make. So it's, um, it's like sounding it out. They need to be able to break a word down into chunks in order to be able to sound it out. Um, so um, actually, letter sounds are technically part of phonological awareness. Um, and the uh, sounds that they make together as chunks are part of that. What, what you can say to parents is that phonological awareness includes the ability to say whether two words rhyme, cat and bat rhyme, but dog and cat don't rhyme, even though your kid might think that they go together. Um, the ability to say words with chunks left out, so C shell minus the C equals shell. Uh, the ability to put two chunks together, tie plus grr equals tie grr. The ability to say one syllable words without the first sound. So that minus the b equals at. And when working with kids about letter knowledge, it's very important to not assign a vowel sound to the consonant sound. So we tend to say ba 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 for b, but when we do that, we're putting an a behind the b, and they have to unlearn that when they come across a word that has a b o or a b e. So make sure that you're saying b b b with no vowel sound after it. Um, singing songs is also a really great way to work on phonological awareness because the pitches move up and down and it breaks up the words naturally. Um, and okay, so then this is another great place to talk about something called crossing the midline. So um, crossing the midline has to do with the way the two hemispheres of the brain communicate, the right brain and left brain talking to each other, right? And that has a lot to do, that has a big impact on phonological awareness and on um, um, reading comprehension later, okay? And, and kids that have problems with phonological awareness are gonna have a really, really, really hard time learning how to read. And the kids that have a natural, like a, a in, inborn problem with phonological awareness tend to be kids that have problems with reading comprehension later too. And a lot of it can actually be traced back to crossing the midline problems. And so one of the ways that you can find out if your child has a problem with crossing the midline is to watch them crawl. And if they crawl by moving their right leg and, and right arm at the same time, that's not the natural way to crawl. The natural way to crawl is to move the opposite arm and leg. Like if you get down on the ground and crawl, it feels more normal for you to move your left leg and right arm at the same time because your body is more balanced that way. So if you are watching your child crawl and they're moving the arm and the leg on the same side of their body at the same time, that indicates that they might need some help working on getting their right brain and their left brain to communicate crossing the midline. 
And those kids that have an early problem with crossing the midline, tend, if it goes unaddressed and, you know, no one helps them with it, there are games that people play. This is a therapy thing. This is not something that I do. Okay, this is someone is referred. <laughs> but those kids that tend to have a problem with crossing the midline later in life tend to have a problem with phonological awareness and then later in life tend to have a problem with reading comprehension as well. All right, so uh, books for phonological awareness, rhyming books like B is for bedtime, animally, anything like that, um, books with alliteration or tongue twisters, nursery rhymes are really great for phonological awareness, um, and I love our, if you guys have not seen our new nursery rhyme book, the clock bound one that's huge and beautiful, that book is phenomenal. You need to get that book and take it to every single party with you because it is a wonderful book. Um, books with songs or sung parts like our musical books. And by musical books, I don't mean the noisy books. I mean the books that actually have real songs in them that you can sing along to them. Um, Lion Speedy Sauce and Elephant's Birthday Bells. While you don't sing the, the story, they have songs that go with them. And those are really great little complementary components. Poetry books are really great for it. And um, books with animal sounds or envi environmental sounds because animal sounds are actually like a very early way to work on phonological awareness. Kids usually can't rhyme until they're, like they're just literally unable to do it until they're like three or four years old. So with a younger kid, you can start working on phonological awareness um, with animal sounds and environmental sounds like the drum goes boom, that's an environmental sound. All right, we're getting some noise interference again, so if you could mute your microphone, I would appreciate it. Sounds like a little baby. Okay, so narrative skills, this is the last skill, and I always leave it for last because it's the most complex, <laughs> and it's um, telling stories. It's the ability to describe things and events and tell stories, and um, this will help a child understand the meaning of what she is reading. It goes hand in hand with good reading comprehension. Kids that have good narrative skills when they're younger will have good, narr good reading comprehension later. Um, and it's important because being able to talk about and explain what happens in a story helps the child understand the meaning. Oh, I just said that. <laughs> Sorry. I'm looking at two different things in notes. Um, so um, things that you can say to parents is make sure that the child has lots of opportunity to communicate with you, not just listen to you talk. And this is really important because two-way communication develops all the areas of the brain associated with language. There are three different areas of the brain associated with language. There's an area that, um, that listens to what you're saying and um, understands it. There's an area of the brain that thinks about what they want to say in response. And then there's a, like comes up with the word. And then there's an area of the brain that actually controls the physical creation of sound. Like the, the my body is creating this sound right now, OK? So when you're involved in two-way communication, you're, you're activating all three areas of those brains um, associated with language at the same time. And that is really, really, really important, not just for language building, but for um, it, it, it will help with their reading comprehension later in life. It helps with their narrative skills. It's just it's a really an important thing to do. Um, and you can actually start working on this even with babies that are not talking back yet, you ask your baby a question, and then you pause, and then you answer. So when you're reading a book with the baby, you say, what color is that bird right there? That's right. That bird is red. And this helps babies figure out how, like, how conversations work. Um, they get like the rhythm of a conversation and things like that. And I forgot to say too that um, back going back to vocabulary, one of the best things that you can do with vocabulary. Sometimes parents will be reading a book with a child, and it'll say cardinal, and they'll replace cardinal with bird because they don't think their child knows the word cardinal. Well, your child is never going to learn anything new. Your child's never going to learn any new words if you never introduce any new words because you don't think they're going to understand them. So don't repl replace 
words that your child doesn't know with ones that they do. Um, say cardinal. And when you read it in context, they're either going to figure it out or they're going to ask you what it means. All right, so anyway, um, back to narrative skills. Talking about the pictures in the book helps develop narrative skills because you're basically telling the story in a different way. You're telling the story in a, in a visual descriptive way. Um, you can have your child flip through a book and tell you a story based on the pictures. That's called taking a picture walk. <laughs> um, but they can tell, make up a story based on the pictures. They tell you what they think is, going, is happening. You can stop a story in the middle and say, what do you think is going to happen next? Um, like they're making predictions about what's going to happen in the story. After the story, talk about what they liked about the story, what they didn't like, if they would have changed anything about it. Um, pick a story that your child knows really well, you know, um, The Three Little Bears or Goldilocks or Pete the Cat or some story that they've read a million times and have them tell you the story. And, uh, and then letting your child use props or puppets to tell a story is a really great work to, way to work on narrative skills too. So um, books to build narrative skills, really great books for building narrative skills are things, um, books that tell a cumulative tale. So things like The Big Snuggle Up are really great for that. Books with repetition in the plot because they're easy for kids to remember. They have lots of um, memory points for them to come back to. Books with a sequence based in the natural world. So um, I could probably think of an Osborne book if I sat down and thought about it for a minute. But the one that always comes to mind is The Very Hungry Caterpillar by Eric Carle. Because if you read a nonfiction book with your child, like if you read, you know, Caterpillars and Butterflies with your child, and they learned about the life cycle of a butterfly, and then you read The Very Hungry Caterpillar or some other fiction book about a butterfly or a caterpillar, and you were reading about a caterpillar and he ate and ate and ate and then he went into a cocoon, you already have this background knowledge. So you stop and you say, what do you think is going to happen next? Well, they're going to use their background knowledge to um, make a prediction about what's going to happen in the story, right? Wordless books are great for building narrative skills because there aren't any words. So the child can can read, can quote unquote read the book themselves. You might need to help them out the first time because often wordless books are have very complex visual stories and kids need to learn to read visual stories just like they need to learn to read print, right? So we're better at that than they are usually, not always, but usually. And um, so we might need to read it to them the first time. But then after they know the story, they can read it. And they can't get it wrong because there's no words. Um, and then we have a lot of books that have toys or character pieces that go with them. Like our tractor book has those character pieces that they use to act out the story, the wind-up tractor book. Market Day, the Slot Together Castle has the, um, the, um, uh, the two armies that they use to act out the um, you know, Wars, the dollhouse that's coming out this fall, Press Out Paper Town has all the character pieces. All of those are really great for building narrative skills. All right, guys, this is our last slide. So I just want to talk really quickly about the difference between decoding versus comprehension, OK? So this sentence here on top, Leah is hippel when she roffs with her mom. So I can read all those words. I can sound out the words hipple and roth, but I don't know what they mean, right? However, if I'm reading a book that's like, you know, a sentence or two in a page in a picture, this picture that's on the slide here might go with that book. And I might be able to deduce from this picture that this sentence actually says, Leah is happy when she reads with her mom. However, when I get older, and I don't have those picture clues to work with, I just might not ever understand what this sentence means. So I could read it. I could decode those words, but I don't comprehend it at all. So this is a really important distinction. Once kids get out of that decoding phase, so like we like to say that kids learn to read up through grade two, and after that they're reading to learn. Okay, and often there's actually a period of time in between that where they're sort of learning how to read to learn. Um, so, so sometimes, you know, like third grade is actually sort of 
learning how to read to learn. But anyway, um, so once they're reading to learn, and they're just reading a chapter book that doesn't have picture clues, they can maybe sound that out. But they need to have the comprehension that goes with it. So um, one of the things that I like to talk to talk about with my parents that come to my booth, when they have a child that's in first or second, sometimes even third grade, depending on their reading level, who is um, out of readers, they're out of the I can read books, but they are not quite ready for big chapter books. They're in our like Hey Jack and our Billy B type books and maybe they want to test the waters in bigger books, I talk to them about the five-finger rule. And here's how the five-finger rule works. You have them flip to the middle of, uh, 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 to a page in the middle of the book that has all words, not a big picture in the middle, okay? And they start at the top, and they read all the way down to the bottom, and um, every time they get to a word that they can't read or that they can sound out but they don't understand what it means, they put a finger up. And if they, and if they can figure out what it means from the sentence, that's different. But if they just don't understand what it means, they put a finger up, okay? If they have five fingers up by the time they get to the bottom of that page, that book is going to be too hard for them and they are not going to enjoy themselves at all. If they have three or four fingers up, it's going to be a nice challenging read that's going to help them move up to the next reading level. And if they have one or two fingers up, it's going to be an easy read for them. And that's not necessarily bad. We don't want kids to be reading nothing but hard, challenging books because they're going to not enjoy reading. If everything they read is a chore, reading is not going to be fun for them. So it's a really good idea to throw in a couple of those one or two finger easy palate cleansing like TV like books because they just they want to have a break sometimes and we want reading to be enjoyable. Um, so this is also a good example of why building your child's vocabulary database is so much more important, is so important because when they are in, you know, third, fourth, fifth, and up grade, when they don't have those picture clues to rely on, we want them to have the biggest vocabulary database possible so that they don't have this problem of being able to decode the word but not comprehend it. Um, or we want to reduce that as much as possible by building up the vo their vocabulary as much as we can. And then not only vocabulary, but background knowledge. We want to make sure that they um, experience things beyond their own life. And reading books is actually a really great way to build that background knowledge for them. And then the last thing I want to point out is that if there is a child that ha is having a problem with reading comprehension, reading is probably not going to be very fun for them, right? So um, one of the ways that we can work, we can activate the same area of the brain that's used in reading comprehension without actually working on reading is by doing maze and puzzle books. Doing maze and puzzle books and problem solving things like that are activate the same area of the brain and will help um, with with reading flow and reading comprehension without having to sit down and force the kid to read for 15 minutes a day. All right, so that's all I have. Does anyone have any questions for me? All right. Thank you guys so much for joining me. I'm going to go ahead and turn off the recording. If you are reluctant to talk on the recording, I will turn it off and I will still be here for a few minutes if you have any questions.